This is a Commodore PET model 4032. For those who don't know, the 4032 model number means that it is a 40 character across screen with 32 kilobytes of memory. Now this isn't the highest configuration PET you can get. You can get an 8032 or one of the later 9000 series, but I would consider this to be the most desirable model of PET as the 40 column display is going to be compatible with the most software. Speaking of software, there were three primary ways of loading it onto the computer. Through the keyboard, off of cassette, or using the focus of today's video, a disk drive. Now, commercial software was released on all three formats. I don't happen to have any commercial disk software because it tends to be a bit rarer than the others. Now, there are several reasons why a floppy disk software would be rare for the Commodore PET. First of all, the drives were expensive. Most installations of PET computers would have one drive connected to multiple PETs over GPIB, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Another reason would be the large variance in capabilities for the plethora of models of floppy disk drives available for the PET. What I have here is the 8050, which is a single-side quad-density disk drive. Aside from the 8250, which is a double-sided disk drive, this one is going to have the highest storage capability, and I could always flip the disk over. Now, the first disk drive was a 2040, which had the smallest capacity available for each disk. The immediate successor, the 4040, expanded upon that, immediately making the 2040 irrelevant. Now, those are both dual disk drive units, but there were also a 4031 and 2031 that were single drive units. Similarly to those, there was an SFD 1001 that was a single drive, double-sided, quad-density drive. Each of those drives also had different DOS capabilities built into the disk drive. So any software publishers for the PET would have no idea what their target audience's disk drive's capabilities would be. Now I mentioned that the disk drive connects using GPIB. Well, what is that? GPIB was one of the first internationally standardized communication protocols. It was used for communicating with test equipment and was even utilized by multiple companies, such as HP for my Series 80 computer. Now, the Commodore PET did not originally ship with a GPIB interface. You would use an adapter cable to connect to one of the ports on the back, which would then be a proper GPIB connection you could connect to other devices. Now, you might be wondering why the cable has an additional connector on the back of it. Well, that allows you to have support for multiple devices connected to the same bus. Unlike RS-232, or serial, which would be the victor in the end, GPIB would allow you to use patch cables, which allow you to connect multiple devices to the same bus. Now, the biggest advantage that this provided would have been to have multiple Commodore PETs on one bus with a single disk drive and a single printer connected to all of them. Multiple PET users would share the single devices connected to the same bus. Now, earlier I mentioned that there were several compatibility problems with the disk drives, including different feature sets, number of drives, and how much data the disks can hold. Well, there was actually one more thing that I left out that has to do with GPIB directly. Basic versions before BASIC 4 don't have native commands for accessing the disk drive. So what you would end up doing is sending commands directly over GPIB to the disk drive to initiate functions. Whereas in BASIC 4, there were commands built into the operating system that would do the same thing. So as a software publisher, it would also be up to you to make sure that your software users understand how to use the disk with their version of BASIC. Now, my Commodore PET has BASIC 4.0, which means I can directly issue a directory command, and it knows what I mean. And now, if we run the command again with the disk drive powered on and a formatted disk in the drive, we can see... It works and is fairly easy to use. Loading a program is easy as well. It's a simple deload, and the name of the program you want to load in quotation marks. And it's obviously much faster than the cassette drive could ever hope to be. Now if we open up the PET and the disk drive, we can take a look at how they work inside. Like other Commodore disk drives, the PET disk drive is basically an entire other computer inside the drive. Matter of fact, this is twice the computer that the PET is, as it has two 6502s in it. The PET only has one 6502, and I never noticed this until now, my PET doesn't have an MOS one. While I'm in here, there's a small repair I need to take care of for drive one. The felt pad that holds the floppy disk to the read-write head of the drive has gotten a bit gnarly over the years. If we compare that to the one on drive zero, we can see it's gotten pretty bad. Now this is a problem because this causes surface damage to any disk I put in there. Which brings us to the minor repair. 
since you can't just walk down to Best Buy and buy floppy drive felt, I'm going to be trying to use some craft store felt and a leather punch to create the correct size circle to put on there. Now, hopefully this doesn't disintegrate as I try to remove it so I can match the size. Oh, that, nah, that came out very easy. Now I just have to determine which one of the sizes on my leather punch fits this best, and I can create a new one. Looks like it's going to be this one. Now before I punch out this new piece, I need to assemble a little bit of backing. So I'm going to start with some cardboard, put on some vinyl tape, with a final top layer of double-sided adhesive. Now I wouldn't want to use something like glue on this because I would think this would wick through the felt and then make the whole thing hard and solid, which would just damage the floppy disks even more. All right, I'm gonna put my backing material underneath of this, press down on it, and punch out my piece. All right, I was able to remove the cardboard from the back of the vinyl tape, so I'm gonna try putting it in now. All right, that's the new felt installed. Let's see what that looks like compared to the old one. Well, it's a little bit fuzzier on the sides, but I think it looks better overall. Let's go ahead and try it out. All right, let's go ahead and give it a shot loading a disc in this drive. All right, it loaded just fine. Now to take a look at the disc. Absolutely no marks on it at all. Now that this open drive is safe again to put discs in, I want to show off why the drives in this Commodore PET drive are pretty interesting. Now on the left, we have a typical five and a quarter inch drive that you'd find in a 5150 or see in something like a TRS-80 Model 4, the disc drives for Coco, all number of vintage computers use drives like this. There is just a single latch that pulls this down, which clamps onto the disc and puts either a backing material or another reed head to the side of the disc. Now, the Commodore PET disc drives are different. You push the disc in, and then it stops. You have to continue pushing on it to activate a latch, which then keeps the disc in place. You then push down on the disc, which presses it down onto a spindle below. At that point, this shifts inwards, allowing this piece to come down and press against the back of the disc. From here, then the disc can be read. If you want to eject the disc, you push down on the latch, which releases, comes back up, but then the disc still does not eject. You have to pull up to finally eject the disc before you can remove it. It's a very different mechanism that's got a lot more moving parts to it, so it's kind of interesting as an earlier drive. Well, I think that's about everything I wanted to cover for the Commodore PET disk drive. This ended up being more of a informational video than I thought it would. Uh, I thought I was just going to do a quick little repair on the inside of this, but hey, I think it ended up being a little better than I thought. So I hope you guys enjoyed that look at a very unusual piece of vintage computer hardware, and I'll see you next time.